I, I'm really honored to introduce uh, Harry Jenkins. Jenkins is a full professor of communication journalism and cinematic arts at the Hanenberg School of Communication at the University of Southern California. He taught for a long time at the MIT in Boston, where he launched the Center for Future, C for Future Civic Media. And uh, he is um, really one of the most interesting thinkers about new forms of new media culture. In Italy, Harry Jenkins is known uh, for um, two books. I just can't read the Italian than a word. The first one, okay, I think the most famous, the Convergence Culture. The second one, yeah. cul uh, Participatory Culture and Digital Competencies. Uh, the title of Henry's uh, speech is How Content Gains Meaning and Value in the Era of Spreadable Media. I invite uh, Harry to make, to do, to give uh, his speech, and then we have uh, a lot of time for discuss, uh, for question, and for uh, uh, make possible to go in depth with our reflection this morning. Thank Henry. Thank Please. you. Thank you very much. Delighted to be here today. First, let me say scusi for using English, uh, but my Italian would not get me through this occasion. So I'm going to try to talk slow enough that people can understand, and uh, hopefully we can have a productive conversation here. Uh, my goal in this talk is to present a kind of overview of the current moment of media change. Some of you will know my book, Convergence Culture, which came out six years ago and tried to capture a snapshot of where media was at at that time. Today, I'm in another moment of sort of reflection because I have three, four very different projects coming out in the next six months that also offer snapshots of where we're at as a, as a society in terms of our relationship to media. The first to come out is this month, uh, the journal Transformative Works and Cultures will run a special issue my team at USC edited on fan activism. So that's some reflections on politics as it relates to an era of remix culture. <clears throat> the second to come out will be a reissue of my book, Textual Poachers, Television Fans, and participatory culture, which will be celebrating its 20th anniversary this year. Uh, and we've done a new edition that reflects on what's happened to fan culture over the last 20 years, uh, and dialogue with several younger fan scholars who are doing some interesting work there. The third to come out will be a book called Reading in a Participatory Culture, which is aimed specifically at teachers and media educators, and is explores how we might teach literature differently in a world of participatory culture. Um, and the four, final one, and the one that I'm mostly drawing on for this talk, is a book coming out in January from New York University Press called Spreadable Media, Creating Meaning and Value in a Networked Culture. And that project I co-authored with Sam Ford and Joshua Green. So what I've tried to do in this talk is choose some sort of high level claims about where we're at as a society and anchor them with some specific examples, mostly drawn from the American context, which is what I mostly study, but also trying to connect with trends that are affecting other parts of the world. And I'm, I look forward to hearing examples from Europe uh, and particularly from Italy as, as we get into our discussion. And if time allows, at the very end, I will, I'm going to share a few thoughts about what we're doing in the area of media and education specifically. Uh, just because we have so many projects in that space and I'd like to share it with people. Um, so, I, the, the use of the word content in this title is kind of a curious one. I, another of my hosts asked me to talk about the future of content and so I pulled together a talk around content. But the more I looked into it, the more I realized that content may not exist as we understand it much longer that the whole notion of a content industry 
is grounded in what we're calling content. But we go to the English language dictionary, this word content in English refers to that which is contained, as in the contents of a bottle, the contents of a can, a table of contents, the contents of a book. So the idea of content is that which is contained is what's at risk in all of the trends that I'm going to talk about in this talk. That we live in a world where what we've been calling content is no longer contained, and its power is precisely the leakiness, the porousness, the spreadability of this content. Uh, and that those new relationships are about breaking down the, the walls and boundaries that have held content in place for so long. So it's not that we want produced media that expresses something fundamental about the human experience or about who we are as a people or what we value as a society. We will produce media, we will tell stories, we will create images, but those images are going to move across every available media platform. And they're going to move from top-down creators to bottom-up communities. And they're going to move across national borders in ways that defy the logics of the industries as they've existed up to now. And so the talk is really about those shifts. So when I pull together a talk, I often end up typing keywords into Google image search and seeing what comes up. Because I think it's a great way to discover what the society is thinking about, what people are associating these ideas with. And so when I put in the word content, this cartoon came up, which I thought was fairly profound in what it had to say. He said, which is more important, content or design? And the answer from the other character is use. Right? So here we have this great tension we've had between the content industries, the, the stories we tell, and the focus on design and increasingly on technology as sort of the causal element that many of us have been drawn on or accused of drawing on in our work. So I should make clear that while I taught for 20 years at MIT, I found myself consistently as a humanities person pushing back against a technological determinist logic that existed in the, in the way MIT thought about the world. That people there believed if you simply designed the right technology, it would inevitably change the society in the direction the designers intended. And I, my job in that context was to be a skeptic and sort of say, no, culture is really significant here. It's what people use with your technology, that the meaning and value of technologies change over time. Uh, and Whereas for much of the rest of the world, I found myself, because I do believe technology matters and that these new infrastructures are enabling us to do th new things and are shifting the scale and speed of our communication, that I was often labeled a technological determinist. And so maybe I found the right balance of being not a technological determinist at MIT, but being accused of one everywhere else I travel. But the reality is that my work is not about technology so much as it's about culture. It's about how people use technology as another element of their cultural and social identity as they form their everyday lives with each other. So technology plays a role here, for sure. We've lived through a period of several decades of profound and prolonged technological and cultural change. That it's affected every aspect of our society and forced us to rethink almost every core assumption we make about what it is to be human. The technology is not driving this. People are driving this. Culture is driving this. It's what we do with technology, how we use technology, that's where the fundamental changes are taking place. So my work continually comes back to cultural logics, to the ways we new configurations of culture that are responding to the risk and potentials of technology. My grad school mentor, John Fisk, wrote in his very last book, Media Matters, says that that new media represent new opportunities to struggle. And he said that at MIT in the, early, in the early 90s, and my students just went berserk. No, new technologies change the world. And he said, no, new technologies create new struggles, right? They shift the ground, they allow new opportunities, but the struggle is what's going to define the future, not the technology. And we are in this room as educators, as students, involved in a struggle for our future across many, many fronts, of which technology may be an asset or it may be a, a barrier to our success. 
So I'm going to try to identify six properties of content in, at the current moment, ways content is in flux. And the first of these is that content is transmedia. The word transmedia simply means across media. That we are, in fact, you know, often when we talk about transmedia, we talk about transmedia storytelling. And that's an important piece of this, and I'll describe that in a minute. But in a larger sense, all kinds of relationships exist between media platforms at the present time. And all kinds of experiences are being held at the intersection between different media platforms. And so we need to think not just about storytelling, but a range of other logics that connect media together, including transmedia learning and transmedia teaching. But here, my example of transmedia is Hunger Games, uh, which until the Avengers opened a few weeks ago, uh, was the most successful box office success in the United States this year. And it had an incredibly powerful social media campaign that fit the logic of the Hunger Games, right? So what they did was they, were, they encouraged people to organize by district, that is where they lived in the United States. If you know Hunger Games, it's organized around a series of districts. So people identified with their district, and they tweeted and discussed and engaged with the book. And as the volume of activity grew up, it unlocked content. And the contents presented as coming from the sponsors, which, of course, in this case has a double meaning, right? Because the sponsors are your benefactors within the world of Hunger Games, but also the brands backing this platform uh, in the world of the movies. So this was a thing where the, the viewer is given an active role in the promotion of the franchise. The viewer become, is seen as an influencer whose ability to use social media spreads the message about a new piece of content that's moving out into the world. But in doing so, the viewer is invited into the fictional world of the Hunger Games, right? The metaphors that structure this interaction are those the Hunger Games has offered to us. So that's an example of what transmedia looks like today. Here's another example that's, in the new, that's been sort of circulating this summer. This is a TED talk from the year 20, 2023, right? So this is a piece of the science fiction film Prometheus, Ridley Scott's prequel slash sequel to Aliens. Uh, and in publicizing this, he realized that early adopters, early people who use technology very actively, have a strong identification with the TED conference as a brand. And so he created a fictional TED talk using his fictional character to introduce some of the core elements of the world of his story and simply put it out on YouTube and anticipated that the spectators would spread that content, would circulate that content, as indeed has happened, that every tech site in the world probably has focused on this TED talk uh, from a fictional, fictional universe as a way of generating awareness of this film's release. This is another piece of transmedia entertainment that greeted me when I first moved to Los Angeles, right? There were these park benches, bus benches, for humans only, uh, suggesting that non-humans were prohibited from sitting there because their corrosive body fluids would destroy the bench. And what you could see this as an advertisement for District 9, and it certainly was. It also was an exchange for us to play in the world of District 9 before we even saw the movie, right? We, you could, I, I sort of fantasized about putting a cat on the bench, looking defiantly into the camera and saying, non-human, who's a non-human? Uh, but um, I think, you know, more than that, it's a piece of exposition. It explains to us the core conflicts of District 9, the human, non-human, the ways in which metaphors of apartheid from the South African experience of the filmmaker got mapped into the science fiction world. And so this is a piece of storytelling, right? It's a very simple piece, it's a very functional piece, but it nevertheless is not just a brand or an advertisement, it's a way of telling the story. Now, we're seeing, there's, some, there's some sort of logic to this, which is that so far what we're describing are ways of built, preparing an audience for a new film release, right? Each of the three examples here are paid for by a promotional budget. And as you talk to the people in the Hollywood side of the industry, they're, they're struggling with the tension between calling this promotion and calling this content, right? For the creatives in the industry, this is not just branding or advertising. This is an extension of the story. This is a way of broadening 
deepening the stories they're telling by moving across other platforms. The Hollywood labor organizations, the guilds, are contending this is content, not promotion, because what's at stake is the structures of payment for creative labor, right? That if it's promotion, they get no additional money, and if any ideas that are generated there have a future life, they get no revenue off of that. If it's content, they get residuals, they get payment for their creative contribution. And so one of the reasons the word transmedia has been picked up so powerfully by media industries in the United States and around the world is it's a tool in a struggle for how we pay for content in the future. And it's a struggle between an industrial model in which everything is a brand and a creative model in which the story is the dominant thing and that the relationship of people, the stories, is what's facilitated by transmedia. And I think that struggle is one that we see playing out again and again. But when a story is over, the transmedia can continue. And we were seeing comics in particular have been a platform by which stories move out of television and film into an afterlife in comics where they continue to thrive. And so Buffy the Vampire Slayer, for example, the creator there finished his seventh season on television and immediately began producing season eight on comics. And he uses that language. The comics for him are part of the continuing story of the television show, that it's just a different medium through which the story is extended. And he's been able to tell a different scale of story in comics than he was able to tell on television. So this is what in convergence culture I call transmedia storytelling. And here is my definition of transmedia storytelling. That it represents a process where integral elements of a fiction get dispersed systematically across multiple delivery channels for the purposes of creating a unified and coordinated entertainment experience. Ideally, each medium maker, each medium makes its own unique contributions to the unfolding of the story. So the idea is, first of all, that key pieces, not sidebars, not you know, trivial little footnotes, but key pieces of the story, integral elements, get dispersed, they get spread across the mediascape across multiple delivery channels, multiple platforms telling the story for the purposes of creating some kind of coherent experience of entertainment. Uh, and that they do so with each making a unique contribution. So if I put my, the same show that I watched on television on a cable or satellite channel, it's not yet transmedia. It's also not transmedia if I simply put it into Hulu or some online platform, or if it gets pirated and put into BitTorrent. Those are the same content moving across media platforms. By transmedia, we mean new content is produced in re as part of the overall system. The content generated for each of those platforms deepens our experience, allows the story to grow in some important way. And that sense of growth or extension or expansion is fundamental to the understanding of what we mean by trans, transmedia. Now, the idea of transmedia in and of itself is not new, right? People have always told stories across platforms. So being an American, I like to talk about one of the founding figures for American transmedia, L. Frank Baum. And L. Frank Baum wrote The Wizard of Oz. And probably for a lot of you in the room, The Wizard of Oz is a MGM musical starring Judy Garland it has a very simple linear story of, you know, will the girl get home or not, and so forth. In fact, that story is the first book in a series of 20 books that L. Frank Baum wrote uh, in the first third of the 20th century. Uh, one a year. But he also didn't just write books, he also created comic strips where the characters of Scarecrow and Cowardly Lion lived. And at one time, his artist had a competing comic strip with the same characters. So there were multiple versions of The Wizard of Oz at play. He also produced movies. He got into movie production quite early on and did both short subjects and feature films set in the world of Oz. And he also got involved in Broadway theater. So he produced stage shows set in the world of Oz. And I say set in the world of Oz because none of them were directly retellings of stories from the book. Each of them added a new story, new characters, new lands, new people. And what, what Baum did is he toured as a lecturer on the vaudeville circuit, and he presented himself as the royal geographer of Oz. So for him, it was a world. 
right? He was a geographer, not a storyteller. He was mapping a complex land and its peoples and its histories and its politics and its struggles through a variety of different media. And he could act as a tour guide and connect those pieces of media together. And that's very much what we mean by transmedia. But traveling through Europe, which has such a strong tradition of cathedrals, I also can take this story back further to reimagine what it would be like to be part of the church and not, not the literate class of the priest, but the bulk of population of Europe in the Middle Ages couldn't read a text. So the story didn't reside in the Bible. The stories lived everywhere in the culture. So you look at the ceilings of the cathedral, you look at the stained glass, you look at the statuary. We imagine the sermon and the choir singing. We imagine the cart dramas outside and maybe the pageants and maybe the nativity set. The story of the Bible lived and across every medium available to the culture at the time, and the belief structure that emerged from that emerges as people connected those pieces together in their hearts and in their, in their souls as they lived in relation to those, those, those stories. So what's new is not that we're telling stories across media. That's fundamental to how human culture works. What's new is digital media is changing the mode of consumption, the ways we relate to those stories in ways that bring about networked consumption, the ability of large groups of people to pool knowledge, to compare notes, to work through these stories together in ways that are not anchored to physical geography. That shift, I think, is fundamental to understanding the changes that are taking place to media. Now, as I said, transmedia is not just stories, it can be other things. So Glee is an enormous success as an American television series in terms of transmedia. In two seasons, two years' time, the cast of Glee has produced more number one pop hits than the Beatles or Elvis. I mean, extraordinary, right? And it did so by putting out every song on the show through iTunes and other platforms, and people are connecting with that music week by week, and it's driving the sales of records in the United States in incredible ways. So that's transmedia performance in the sense that they are creating content and building relationships that play out across media platforms. Now what's interesting is a lot of the performance is not top created top down by the producers, but emerges bottom up because Glee is about amateur singers. Lots of amateur singers attach themselves to Glee. And if you go to YouTube, which is where all the, most of these videos up here come from, these are YouTube videos showing people doing karaoke, doing lip sync, making animated music, anime music videos in response to the songs and performances on Glee. And you pick, I picture an executive meeting someplace on the production lot of Glee saying, we have the power to write YouTube and take this stuff down. Right? We can just clear all that out. But they clearly made a decision not to do that. And it's because this energy bottom up of claiming ownership over the content and re-performing it is part of what's driving the extraordinary commercial engine that's become the Glee cast and the Glee music. So their success rests not, the fans in that case are not destroying or damaging the success of the franchise. They're building it up through their participation. And that brings us to my second trait of the modern media landscape. In the current era, media is participatory in the sense that media gives us a chance to do something. Right? I talk in convergence culture about textual attractors. Those draw people to a piece of medium. But we also have cultural activators. That is, they give us something to do. We, in an age of participate, we demand the right to participate. So this image is of an a, a campaign for Spider-Man. They did an alternate reality game around Sp the new Spider-Man movie. And they passed out these stencils, and they encouraged people to spray paint the Spider-Man logo in cities around the world. Maybe you've seen some here in Milan. I haven't, but there could be some in Milan. Now, what's fascinating about this is the studio gave the fans permission to paint their logo without calling it copyright or trademark infringement. But the city hasn't given them permission to paint the building. So, so it sort of points to the degree to which our ability to participate is shaped both by commercial constraints and by legal and political constraints. And that those things don't always work together in the at the current moment. The, the, the cultural logic is one of demanding to participate. And there are potential constraints on our participation 
shaped by both commercial factors and by political factors that we have to understand if we understand the nature of participation. So this website represents two very different modes of participation at the current moment. First of all, it's a, many of you will recognize it, it's a Wikipedia page. And Wikipedia has become a really powerful research tool, reference tool, created bottom-up by the community, right? People all over the world pool knowledge, contribute knowledge together, and create something new that didn't exist before via Wikipedia. And Wikipedia may be its most powerful when it talks about knowledge that never would have been in the encyclopedia, right? Instead of reading it against Encyclopedia Britannica, saying which is more up to date, we read it against um, what doesn't exist before, which is a reference book for popular culture, right? And, and the ability to pool that information together is a particularly effective use of Wikipedia and the kind of dispersed media culture we're describing. But we use it in our teaching. So I was working with a school in Indiana that the school had banned Wikipedia and said that young people shouldn't be using it. And we came in and said, we integrated into a course we were de developing around Herman Melville and Moby Dick, uh, the, what's considered a great American novel. And we encouraged the students to add information to the Herman Melville entry on Wikipedia. And they brought what they learned in their class and added it to the page. And they got pushed back. Some people challenged what they'd written, and they had to debate and argue and prove their point. And some of the changes they made stuck and survived the scrutiny. Some of them didn't. But they came through with a sense that they had the ability to contribute knowledge to the world, that they knew things that the world could value. And that process of bringing research alive in your classroom was a really powerful use of Wikipedia in school. So we weren't just saying trust or don't trust Wikipedia. We're saying understand, look underneath the hood, understand how Wikipedia works and what its potential is for animating the research process in the school setting. But the second thing that's going on here, and this is an entry about fan fiction. And fan fiction is another kind of what I'm calling participatory culture. So in fan fiction, hundreds of thousands of people around the world write original stories, short stories and novels in response to mass media text. It could be Harry Potter, it could be Glee, it could be Lost, it could be any number of stories. But they're writing their own versions and putting them online. And this community has developed a really powerful mechanism of self-critique. So that any new entry is assigned to a more experienced writer who gives the, vet, the newcomer advice, feedback, copy editing, uh, style advice, theme advice, structure advice. And the people who participate, the young people especially who participate in this, say they get much more feedback in this process than they ever get from their teacher at school. You know, they get valuable response, valuable ability to learn about how to grow as a writer in this process. So both of these are what we call participatory culture. And this, is, this definition here is aimed at educators, but it grows out of a white paper I wrote for the MacArthur Foundation about about how we learning changes when we begin to take these mechanics into the classroom. So this is the definition of how learning takes place in communities of gamers and fans. First, there are relatively low barriers for engagement. It's easy to join, easy to participate. There's strong support for sharing your creations with each other. There's an informal mentorship in which more experienced people help newcomers learn how to, how to do what they do. And I put it that way because this line's not just adult to child. In fact, it can be the other way. One of my students started writing fan stories at 13. By 14, she was a beta reader, which meant she was giving feedback to adults and youth alike about their writing. And by 15, she helped create with a team, with a team of adult fans one of the most power, popular Harry Potter fan fiction sites in the world. She went on to be my graduate student, and now she works as chief participation officer for The Alchemist, a transmedia company uh, that's based in Rio and Los Angeles. So her trajectory was shaped by her involvement at a very early age in creating and sharing things. All right, continuing, the members believe their contribution matters, and they care about each other's opinions of themselves and their work. And the quote says, not every member must contribute, but all must believe they're free to contribute when they're ready, and that what they contribute will be appropriately valued. So fans act as if every reader is a potential writer, and they just haven't found the story they're ready to tell yet. 
So the sense that they're always ready to, always on the verge of participating, animates this community. It doesn't mean everyone has to participate, but it does mean the sense of being able to participate is in place. So Jean Love, in her book on legitimate peripheral participation, tells us to make a distinction between the legitimate peripheral participation of people eager to participate but haven't found their voice yet, and structural barriers that prevent some groups from participating. And we have to be careful to distinguish between the two. We have an obligation to go after structural obstacles to participation, what I call the participation gap. You know, there's a distinction to draw between the digital divide, which is access to tech, about access to technologies, and the participation gap, which is about access to skills and opportunities to participate. So in America, we've reached a point where 95% of teens in America have access to digital and networked technology. Europe's not there yet, but it's, it's moved fairly fast in that direction. But you can have access to the technology and not have access to powerful communities where learning's taking place. You can access to technology and not have an adult mentor who understands what the online world is like and can give young people meaningful advice about their participation. You can have access to technology and not feel empowered to use it, to not feel ready to share, able to share your voice with the outside world. And so the struggles now are over the participation gap, not over the digital divide. It's not about access to technology. It's about access to social and cultural skills which empower our use of technology. And that's the struggle educators have the most vital role to play. Because when we, you know, our schools have wired the computer and disabled the, have wired the classroom and disabled the computer. They put computers in the school and then disconnected them from all of the meaningful forms of participation that young people are learning from outside of school. They block, they put, and American schools have mandatory filters. They block access to information. They block access to YouTube. They block access to space, Facebook and MySpace and Twitter and Flickr and the blogosphere and tell kids that Wikipedia is a dangerous thing to use. They, they go through and just block every form of participation in the name of keeping kids safe. What they're doing is making kids at more at risk, right? Because kids are safer when, no, when a trained adults who are teachers and educators and librarians and museum specialists and ministers are helping them navigate the space. Then when we say, we can't deal with it at school, find a way to deal with it on your own. You know, we're, kids today are learning about the internet the way my generation learned about sex in a back alley. And the problem is we've got to change that dynamic by bringing media literacy centrally into the classroom, which is a struggle faculty teachers are facing all over the world. Now, when, when, many people, when they hear me talk about participatory culture, assume I'm talking about Web 2.0. And I want to make clear that these are two very different things. This is a chart that Tim O'Reilly produced in his essay, What is Web 2.0? The participatory culture has a several hundred year history of the struggle of everyday people to gain greater control over the means of cultural production and circulation. Right? This, is, this is a grassroots struggle for communicative capacity. Web 2.0 is a six-year-old, seven-year-old business plan which attempts to commodify and capitalize on our desire to participate. It's a, more, it's a form of business, right? Sometimes those businesses give us new tools and new ways of connecting to each other that are really powerful. And I'm not, I, I see something really great comes out of Web 2.0. But sometimes they're simply attaching themselves to our communities and seeking to control them for their own ends. And I think there's a lot of legitimate criticism to be leveled at it. So the language of Web 2.0 assumes an easy alignment between producers and consumers. But if we look at these sites, every one of them have been the site of struggles over data surveillance and privacy, over copyright and censorship, over branding and commodification, uh, that these debates have waged in all of these communities who claim a sense of connection to each other that's greater than the connections they feel to these companies and these platforms. And so I think what we need to do is bring together a critical studies language about uh, Web 2.0 and some of the critiques that, you know, around labor, around privacy, around locking down owner membership and so forth that many great critical studies people have done with the cultural studies insistence that nevertheless, despite these constraints, grassroots communities are using these tools to serve their own ends, to pursue their own politics, to find their own voice, to, to form their own learning cultures. 
And so participatory culture is worth fighting for in the face of Web 2.0. It's not I'm celebrating Web 2.0. I'm, in fact, very critical of Web 2.0. But I'm arguing that there's something important we want to fight for as a society that we use Web 2.0 to achieve. So my third area is that content is remixable. That is, once content has been digitized, we can mix it up and mash it up and do a variety of things with it. It becomes a resource we use to communicate our sense of the world with. This is a very playful piece of content. Someone took the characters and situations from Toy Story and mapped them into The Shining. Uh, so if you look there, you can see lots of key moments from the film, horror film The Shining played out with the characters from Toy Story. And this goes along, this exists alongside with, the, some of you have seen the YouTube video where someone turned The Shining into a romantic comedy by cutting and editing the, edit, the footage together. This is a kind of cultural expression right now, and it's being used in this context in a very playful way. I mean, it's not toward any end other than the fun of mashing content together. This, on the other hand, is political speech as it exists in the era of YouTube. This is a video called The Right Wing Radio Duck. It was created by a video maker named John McIntosh. And it took the right wing radio host, Glenn Beck, who's an ultra conservative in the American context, and put, used his to create a soundtrack, which he juxtaposed with Donald Duck cartoons. And it, you'd have to see it to believe it, but it really is a very effective critique of the kind of paranoia of the Tea Party in the United States and the ways that politics has played itself out. It was such an effective critique that some of the right-wing radio hosts began to circulate the, a conspiracy theory that it was actually funded by the Obama administration because it was so professionally polished. Well, it turns out it was made by a 22, 23-year-old in his dorm room on his own computer, right? So in fact, what we're seeing is the quality that can be generated by amateurs or semi-professionals using home equipment now becomes so solid that even industry professionals confuse it with totally professional content. And, that, and that's where struggles began to take place over what constitutes speech in a network society. Here's another political use of remix culture. Uh, here we see the Hope poster created by Shepard Ferry uh, for the Obama campaign. And Shepard Ferry now has been in legal struggles with the Associated Press because he took a, photo, a news photograph and, as the basis for his work. But meanwhile, as Shepard Ferry is struggling with this, all over the internet, people have created their own versions of the Hope poster as political satire of one sort or another, and even tools which make it very simple to take your own photograph and turn it into your own Hope poster, right? So, so it's become a model for grassroots appropriation. While we're stuck struggling over one example of appropriation and its legal ramifications. So I said earlier that the struggle of, the, the, that, that we are blocked in many ways in our participation by both com commercial and legal barriers. So we're at the moment where the struggles of the 21st century will be struggles over the terms of our participation. And one of those battles has been over copyright. So this is a group called the Living Room Rock Gods. And the Living Room Rock Gods make YouTube videos where they try to duplicate various performances by rock and roll stars. Right? They try to copy the drum riffs of the drummer. They try to capture the chords of the guitar, so forth. They make these videos. And they were throwing them up on YouTube. And YouTube's automatic copyright police program was catching them and identifying them as copyright infringement and taking them down. And for this group, this was seen as a real success because they were sounding so much like the actual recording that they were being caught and taken down off, off of YouTube as if they had directly pirated the music. And so that was a measure of how good they were at their art. But at a certain point, they realized that all of their content was being taken down. And they became more and more angry at a world where what they did as tribute to their favorite bands was being seen as piracy and was being taken down as fast as they were putting it on. So they, in fact, organized uh, online education around intellectual property law in the United States. And they produced videos to explain to people what YouTube was doing, how to fight YouTube, what the struggles over copyright were. And this group became involved fairly recently. There was a debate about Amer changing American copyright law, so-called the SOPA bill. And this was a bill that many grassroots communities organized and fought back against and successfully defeated in the US Congress. 
So you, so Wikipedia went black that day and encouraged people to send letters to their congressmen. Reddit was very central to this. But many of these small scale communities also played a key role in mobilizing their members and their friends and families to write in. So in the past, Hollywood's been able to write the law about intellectual property in the United States. You know, with very little challenge because the news media doesn't cover copyright law. They would tell you it's because they didn't think anyone would be interested. Because I've asked them, CNN told me this. They don't cover these bills because the public doesn't care about them. In fact, the company cares a great deal about that law and has every reason not to tell us about it. But the public increasingly has educated itself about copyright because it affects their everyday practices. They see themselves implicated in these laws and they're now more and more effective at mobilizing to challenge these laws. And so the struggle over intellectual property rights is shifting in the United States and potentially elsewhere in the world because of the degree to which more and more people are taking advantage of the communicative capacity to create and share culture with each other. And this is one of the key battlegrounds that we're going to have to pay attention to. Four, content is spreadable. And I'm told this is a word that doesn't translate very easily into Italian, so, so bear with me a little bit on this. We, we, we originated this word to describe a distinction between stickiness, which is a word that's often used to describe web content, that you want a sticky site, i.e. one that people go to and stay there. They're stuck to your site. And we're trying to contrast to that to a model where content travels very fluidly, where value is created by people moving your content from place to place. Uh, and so we were intentionally playing around with notions of jam and jelly and butter and pate and cheese. Anything you spread on a piece of toast is a pretty good metaphor to talk about going from something that's sticky to something that we actively shape and move across culture. So someone picked up on that meaning. This is someone's appropriation of our book idea. And even before the book's out, someone's done a mashup of it saying spreadable media preserves culture. So preserves in English is another word for jelly or jam. So they're sort of playing with this idea of jam. We don't care whether you call it spreadable or something else. What we're trying to do is challenge some of the ways we talk about how media travels at the present moment. That's the, the essence of this argument. So in the fall, I went to New York, and I stopped by the site of Occupy Wall Street. Uh, and the day I was there, just as I got there, a busload of zombies was offloaded. These were horror fans who'd gone to a local science fantasy horror convention and showed up as activists to participate in the protest. It turns out that the zombie had become an important metaphor of the Occupy movement. The zombie stands for undead corporations. It is companies that should have died a natural death but were kept alive by eating the blood and brains of the 99%. I've been kept alive by government tax money and so forth that's taken from poor and middle class people to subsidize very rich corporations. That's their version of it. So they're on the front lines at this point, talking to the public and explaining to them what the Occupy movement's about, getting their picture taken, and that picture floats across the web in a variety of ways. If I went a little deeper into the Occupy site, I would see people wearing Guy Fawkes masks, from, for which were Americans. Doesn't connote a British protest, it connotes V for Vendetta. I would see uh, game, people dressed like characters from Games of Thrones, who talked about the Lannister 1%. Uh, we saw people dressed as characters from children's shows, uh, talking about, you know, 1% of the monsters get 99% of the cookies. Uh, all kinds of messages, all kinds of street theater that were taking elements of popular culture and using it as a tool to express political beliefs. So this is Remix, but it's coupled with a powerful use of social media. So all of these photographs, all these videos, all the websites spread across social media. They get tweeted about. The people put them on their Facebook page. Uh, they get spread through a variety of channels. And that's really very much part of the strategy and tactics of the Occupy movement. They are trying to, they're not just a movement, they are a provocation. They are trying to change the conversation in America about class, about economics. And they're doing so by inserting themselves into every conversation possible by creating media that travels very easily from place to place, from community to community. 
So here's an example of that process at, at work. This is the pepper spray cop. The pepper spray cop was a campus policeman at the University of California, Davis, who pepper sprayed a group of protesters who were sitting peacefully on the grass. And this is a sort of story that might have gotten local coverage, it might have gotten campus coverage, it certainly wouldn't have gotten national or global coverage if it wasn't for the fact that people took that photograph and in the course of two days' time, mashed it up in all kinds of other images, paintings, film scenes, political photographs, and spread it across the internet. So that in two days' time, there were more than 200 remixes of Pepper Spray Cop circulating across the internet, and the media had to cover the story at that point, and Pepper Spray Cop became an icon of the Occupy movement because of the choices of individuals to remix and spread that content. So this is the, the slogan of our book is, if it doesn't spread, it's dead. In other words, content that's locked down, content that doesn't move, is irrelevant, unimportant, unvalued, without value in the network society we're moving toward. The value is created and meaning is created by acts of circulation. Those are my two co-authors on top, Joshua Green, Sam Ford. This grows out of a conversation we've had starting at MIT through a group called the Convergence Culture Consortium. When the book comes out in January, it will be surrounded by 40 essays, a total of 75,000 words written by 40 other people. Some of them are colleagues and other scholars, some of them are industry leaders, some of them are former students, responding to the book. And all of that content will go up free online. So we're going to start spreading content around the book in November. So by the time the book comes out, there will be 40 essays that annotate and expand the argument of the book. Because we've built into the book itself the principle of spreadability, the process of unlocking content, of sparking conversation, of encouraging people to take your content and bring it to other spaces. So at the core of the book is a distinction between circulation and distribution. So by distribution, I mean the old corporate logic which determines when we have access to content. So for example, Hollywood decided to release the Avengers in, the United, in Europe before it released in the United States. So you got it a week before we did. A week, by the way, that meant I haven't seen it yet because it, it was not in America when I left and I haven't seen it in Europe, but okay. Anyway, it was their, their choice. Corporate decision, right? Uh, corporate decision, when do we show American shows on Sky Network here or on some other you know, satellite network? How does that stuff cross the ocean? When do you see it? Those are corporate decisions. Circulation refers to the world we live in now where that's still partially key, but more and more content moves because people choose to move it. Because all kinds of unaffiliated, un bottom-up forces are take making unauthorized use of content and moving it from place to place. Now, I'm using the term unauthorized use to distinguish because I want to avoid the word piracy. Right? We could call this pirated content. The problem is that makes a moral judgment instantly that shuts down other discussions we need to be having about whether this practice is damaging or valuable to the companies that are involved with it. Does this, in fact, enhance the value of the content rather than damage it? Does it, in fact, change the way it travels through the culture and increase its visibility? So we're focusing on unauthorized movement of content from place to place. So we can have, in fact, a long term, a better discussion of what we mean piracy or what we think the new moral economy around content should look like. Now, a lot of what I'm describing, people instantly turn to and call viral media. And we think viral media is entirely the wrong way to talk about or think about what's going on here. So here's Neil Stevenson, the science fiction writer, whose work Snow Crashed helped to frame the discussion around viral media almost 20 years ago. He writes, we are all susceptible to the pull of viral ideas, like mass hysteria, or a tune that gets in your head that you keep on humming all day until they spread it to someone else. Jokes, urban legends, crackpot religions, Marxism. There were how... Uh, how smart we get, there's always the deep irrational part that makes us potential host for self-replicating information. So we can leave aside whether you agree or disagree about what content is valuable or not, but just the basic mechanisms he's describing there are ones that mean content happens to us, content is not something we use. Right? The viral is a metaphor of infection. Something infects us and we unknowingly carry it out and infect other people with it. 
What we're calling spreadability is about conscious choices to move ideas from one population to the other. So Stevenson uses language like susceptibility, hysteria, irrationality, self-replication. These all suggest the information travels on its own and we simply lose control. Whereas those people who took the pepper spray cop and mashed it up with other images or chose to pass that content along are involved in a process of actively spreading content. They're making decisions out of all that stuff that comes through your inbox every day. What's worth passing on to your friends? Which are the links you share? Which are the videos you embed in your, 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 your live journal? Which are the ones you pass along through Twitter? Who do you pass it along to? What messages do you attach to it? Those are conscious decisions people are making at individual and collective levels that are affecting the contents of our culture in very powerful ways. So here's an example of that principle at work. CUNY 2012. How many of you know about CUNY 2012? Most of you? Well, it looks like a generation divine here of some sort. <laughs> okay, so CUNY 2012 was a half hour documentary of, about human rights violations in Africa, aimed at a specific Ugandan warlord who'd been involved in child soldiering. It was created by a group called Invisible Children out of San Diego, which is a nonprofit organization, really has focused on training young activists and trying to mobilize young activists to take action about particular conditions in Africa. Now, this is a portrait of how media travels. These, these bars show videos that have reached 70 million viewers in the United States. Right, and each of these videos, the, the more, and, and, and this is how, long, how many days it took to get there. So Sneezing Panda took 901 days to go from being posted to reaching 70 million views. So huge scope, relatively slow speed. Uh, we can talk about Charlie Bit My Finger, took 402 days to go to that level. Uh, we could talk about David After the Dentist, took 262. Some of these videos you'll know, some of them you want. We, some of this content is amateur, some of it is commercial. So old, the Old Spice campaign that came out, you know, Smell Like a Man, reached, took 158 days to reach that critical point. The Susan Boyle video, which was a musical performance on Britain's Got Talent, took only seven days to reach that point. And CUNY 2012, a half-hour documentary about human rights violation in Africa, reached that point in four days' time. The organizers who created the video, we talked to them, and they said they expected to reach half a million viewers by the end of May. Their expectations were blown away by the speed with which this video got taken up and moved from place to place. All of this without being broadcast. So just to put in a, real, a scale, in the United States, the highest rated show on American television gets about 40 million viewers. Hunger Games, which had the biggest opening weekend of, one of the biggest opening weekends of all time, brought in about 17 million viewers into the theater that same week as CUNY 2012 had. So you could take the viewership of the highest rated shows on American television, add the box office for the highest grossing movie that week, and still not get up to the level of this video that was circulated entirely on a grassroots level. That's pretty amazing by any scale we want to talk about. And there are plenty of critiques of the video. It's been hotly debated. I'm not endorsing the video. I'm just describing it as, an, as part of a logic of circulation that's going to affect the world we live in in powerful ways. Social Flow, which has done some attempts to map the tweets around this video, gives us a picture of how this video circulated. And you can see at the center of the page, they're invisible, the organization Invisible Children and Jason Russell, the filmmaker, play a really large role in sending it out initially. We can see there that part of the campaign of CUNY 2012 was targeting celebrities, targeting fans of celebrities to amplify their circulation by getting celebrities to retweet. And Kirsten Bell from Veronica Mars was one of the first celebrities to retweet. And so she gets, in fact, a lot of traffic coming out of that. But what's really interesting here is things that are in the circles are mid-sized towns in the middle of America. Birmingham, Alabama, Dayton, Ohio, Pittsburgh, Oklahoma City. These are not New York, Los Angeles, where entertainment typically flows from. They're not even Atlanta, where CNN and Turner networks are based. They're not Chicago or Washington, DC. These are the cities that are shaping the conversation around CUNY 2012. And they're a different set of influencers. It's, it's the sort of people that are normally forgotten 
when we talk about media in America that in fact made the choice to pass this along. And that's because Invisible Children had actively recruited supporters in those communities over the last eight years, particularly among young people, particularly among Christian groups. They were able to build a, a base that once the video was ready and they spread, that initial base pushed it out. And as they pushed it out, they framed it in a variety of ways. So this wordle shows us the language used in the tweets. And we see two layers, at least, of communication here. We see a lot of words associated with the Christian church, like Jesus and God and love and life. We can see that played a really large role here. But we can also see words like student, fan, music, university, which suggests the student-based population also played a really active role, which could account for why this side of the room is far more aware of the Cooney 2012 video than folks on this side of the room, right? That there's a generational divide. This went directly through young people, and we've been studying Invisible Children as a group that's mobilizing young people as activists to participate in debates about society, and that we see it as a successful organization and its tactics for getting young people involved. All right, the last two definitions, and we'll see how I'm doing on time, the four, fifth one is content is global. So just as we move, it moves across platforms and it moves across the user and the creator relationship and it moves through the internet in very active ways, it's also moving across national borders in really powerful ways. So this image is from an American show called Smash. I'm not sure if it's reached Italy yet or not, but it's been doing fairly well in the American context, in the middle of which it has a 10-minute sequence that uses Bollywood dance choreography to tell its story. Now, Bollywood is not played in the multiplexes in the United States. It's something that's moved from ethnic grocery stores into local screenings, into film festival runs. It's starting to seep into our advertisement. People are watching it online. Netflix distributes it. But it's never had mainstream commercial success in the United States. But it's now part of the language American television is using to tell its stories because the assumption is this, store, this language is now accessible to a significant number of viewers in the United States. So Smash will introduce some people to Bollywood dance, but many people will have already seen it through all of those other informal channels that this stuff is circulating through. And it's an example of a world where, media, where we may have once imagined the world where American media dominated the planet and it does to some degree, especially as Europe struggles to fund national cinema and when we, you know, as you're dealing with economic crisis. But what we're also seeing is other movie, media producers are moving into the American market and more and more being a factor in the life of our young people. So we're, this is part of a process of very porous relationships. The world is anything but flat. There are gross inequalities in who has the resources to produce media, who has the opportunity to distribute media. But as we factor grassroots circulation into how media flows, we can see content move across national borders in ways that are not centered, at, not from powerful cultural producers out, but across national communities in ways that I think are changing the world. So my colleague Nancy Bame, who now is based at, in Boston, has a book she's finishing on the Swedish music industry. And she's writing about this industry where there's, that has had done very little to sell itself commercially in the United States, but has relied very much on grassroots channels to build awareness, and bands are touring the United States without ever releasing a record there. Right? It's a very interesting phenomenon where the piracy built the awareness and base that then the performers travel on, and it turns out that some of the, one of the leading Swedish music labels shares its office with the Pirate Party in, in, in Sweden. That they're then far from seeing a war between the record industry and the pirates, they see themselves as closely aligned to break down barriers that are blocking the circulation of media in other parts of the world. They see themselves as having more to gain by freeing up circulation than locking it down. And it's a very interesting part of the story of how porousness exists. But porousness also results in something like the impact of the Arab Spring movements on young people around the United States and I suspect around the world. People call it a Twitter revolution. I think that's a misunderstanding. By and large, the social media was not that central in the organizing of the uprisings. Where social media played a role was allowing the protesters to communicate to the world beyond the Arab world without going through government censorship, without going through corporate media channels, to push messages out to the population globally. 
right, through, through Twitter, through social media, through YouTube. We saw images from the streets. We heard voices from the streets. And that led the public, in fact, the United States to demand more media coverage and more attention paid on what was taking place in the Arab world than they would have otherwise. This was a story that had not gotten a lot of coverage, and suddenly, as it came through Twitter, people began demanding more of it. So the, the best research on what happened there in terms of digital media was that Twitter was an amplifier. It enabled sort of global awareness rather than an organizer that was involved on, local, on the local level. And that's, that's something we have to understand. But we have to understand that it's one technology among many that the movement uses to reach the world. This image down here with the yellow sign, this is the same time that some of the Arab Spring events, the Cairo event was taking place in Madison, Wisconsin. There was a big labor uprising because the governor of Wisconsin tried to ban public unions. And students took to the street to protest in what was the largest protest in American history. And supporters in Egypt were holding up signs saying Egypt supports Madison. Because there was, in fact, social media connecting those groups of people together without going through commercial media necessarily. And I think that's part of the story. My final idea here is that content may be increasingly independent. It's not that mass media is going to go away or that major media conglomerates are going to collapse. They're not. And we should be very, very concerned about the concentration of media ownership around the world. But there are probably more opportunities now for independent media makers to produce and share media with each other than has ever existed before. That there are new ways that independent media makers are getting their ideas out from ways they were blocked by previous governmental and capitalist structures to get into circulation. So this film, Inc., was a fan low-budget fantasy film that couldn't find a distributor. They couldn't get anyone to show their movie. So they self-pirated. They put it out on BitTorrents themselves. And then, they, then as the visibility built, as people were downloading and sharing this movie to each other, then they were able to sell the DVDs and get them into circulation. And it's been a modest success, a bigger success than most low-budget fantasy films reach without ever reaching the multiplexes, without ever going through a commercial distributor, they've been able to build awareness around this particular story. Iron Sky comes here, here in Europe, right? This is a film from Finland that was crowdsourced, crowdfunded, that's used grassroots mechanisms to get publicity out and is gradually opening the summer in markets around the world with a lot of interest and awareness because of its ability to take advantage of the processes of spreadability that we've talked about. This is another film I, we write about in the book, Sita Sings the Blues, is a beautiful animated film by a feminist filmmaker that, again, she gives the film away for free online, but she counts on her supporters to try to rally interest in showing in local theaters, local museums, local arts festivals, to buy the DVDs. And she says she's more than recouped the cost of production and is going on to finance her second film off the success she's had of combining free circulation with other kinds of mechanisms to collect money. So she's, she's, in fact, using the systems we're describing to ensure her production. So I haven't seen anyone put all of the pieces together yet, but one can imagine a filmmaker starting with a company like Kickstarter, which is a micropayment site. People, artists propose projects. They seek public mo to give money to them. Individuals make small investments, $10, $20, $30, from that process, they build up a base of support. Lost Zombies has worked with its fan base to create a, a community-generated zombie film, right? They identified all the shots they needed for this movie, and they asked amateur filmmakers to shoot their own footage and send it in, and had the community curate the footage to decide which footage uh, was most valuable, and they've constructed an entire film, you know, that brings this stuff together. And Brave New Films does what it calls self-curating or crowd-curating. That people basic, they basically reach out to their supporters and use their supporters to get to hold house parties. So people show it in their living rooms and lead discussions around it. They organize public screenings. So here is a system. If we combine those three things, you would have filmmakers who get built a relationship with their fans or supporters from the moment the project is conceived and build on that relationship to get it out through production and into the theater in a way that lowers the cost of production, lowers the challenges of distribution, and lowers the cost of publicity in really powerful ways. Now, that's going to work for some filmmakers better than others. But um, the, um, you know, what we're seeing is it works really well for fantasy films, science fiction films, horror films, which have a strong fan base going in. 
It also works for minority filmmakers of all time, of all kinds. So feminist filmmakers, members of racial or ethnic minority groups who have very strong commitment to content that is under, in communities that are underserved by the population, by the mass media of their, of their country, are well served by these alternative channels of production and distribution. Uh, we're seeing political minorities, uh, the far left, the far right, will be using those channels very, very effectively. What will not be served are those kinds of filmmakers that are traditionally get government subsidies here in Europe, right? Those filmmakers who are trying to reflect national culture or personal vision rather than something that speaks directly to an audience that understands themselves as having a connection to that material going in. Those are the filmmakers most at risk, the most needing of government subsidies to support their productivity. But the other kinds of filmmakers may be better served avoiding government and corporate channels, but working through these new systems of distribution. So that's, I think, uh, where we're at at the present moment in terms of media. Uh, I think the biggest shift since I wrote Convergence Culture has been this move towards social media enabling and empowering grassroots circulation, and those mechanisms changing fundamentally the way the media landscape works. The second biggest is the move that I predicted in Convergence Culture from playing with media content to turning media content into a resource for social and political change. And I think we're studying, we saw a few examples of that here. It's something I want to talk about more fully, hopefully when we get some questions at the end. So how am I doing on time? I suspect I'm more or less out. So I, should, I will skip over some of the stuff on education. We'll bring that in in the discussion. Great.